We are very lucky to have with us live in the studios this morning, Paul Kivel. Paul Kivel is an activist, a trainer, a writer, and a violence prevention educator. He has authored numerous books, including Boys Will Be Men, Raising Our Sons for Courage, Caring, and Community, and Uprooting Racism, How White People Can Work for Racial Justice. And he's here to talk about his new book, You Call This a Democracy, Who Benefits, Who Pays, and Who Really Decides. Let me begin and ask you, what was your motivation in writing your book, You Call This a Democracy? I had a couple of motivations. Um, you know, I've been doing work around social justice issues for a long time, and I've been noticing that a lot of us are working on particular issues, particular campaigns, particular you know, environmental issues, uh, male violence issues, uh, housing issues, a, a range of issues. And very often, though, we're doing those with a very limited framework, not really understanding how the larger system of power, violence, class works. And so we're, we, do those, we do that work without building a long-term understanding in the community about what the struggle is really about, the, the fact that we do have a ruling class and a power elite, and that um, these issues are interconnected, and we have to be working together, seeing how our issue connects to other issues. Uh, you know, in the history of this country, we have the kind of a myth of democracy, that it's a democratic country, uh, there's equal opportunity, that everybody has, you know, it's a level playing field. Uh, we don't even have a vocabulary for talking about, you know, the, the the phrase ruling class doesn't roll off our tongues very easily. But in fact, we, we have always had a ruling class in the United States, uh, a top 1% of the population that controls any, you know, anywhere from 40 to 50% of the financial wealth of the country that um, makes the decisions or, or designates who makes the decisions that influence our lives. So unless we're clear about how that whole system works, we're never going to actually be able to um, accomplish large-scale social change. Talk about some of the history of the ruling class in this country. I think a lot of people assume we, uh, we left that behind on the shores of uh, England when we uh, sailed over. Well, we, w the... The people who started the country, the, the, what we call the Founding Fathers, were very much a subset of the British ruling class. Um, they, they either came over with great wealth or they were given you know, land and the opportunity to build wealth in that early period. They set up very hierarchical societies in the early colonies. Um, they were an elite group. There was um, you know, the Constitution, and then they wrote the Constitution for themselves. Um, basically. Um, they said that only rich white men can vote. Um, and at that point, they were talking about, by rich, anybody who owned property, that was about 10% of the, the population. So that meant that the Constitution was written to exclude 90% of the people who they considered part of the population of the United States. Um, so w when they said all men are created equal, uh, they meant w white men with wealth who they knew, you know, who were in the networks of the people that they talked to. Um, and so that's continued on, and the, the ruling class has is, is changed dramatically over time. You know, different kinds of industries have risen, different kinds of formations as the country expanded. Um, but there's the people making the decisions have always been a small elite in this country. Now, what happened originally, um, and I think this is a really important piece, was that the, the, the ruling class, the, the men who were rich and powerful, were also the direct decision makers because it was a small enough society that they actually also ran the, the businesses and the farms and the plantations and, and the, the, the slave industries. And, um, you know, as the country grew, um, there needed to be still people in charge, but there was a much larger ruling class. So that 1% of the population expanded, um, and there began to be more of a concentration of, today we have about seven to 10,000 white uh, Christian men, predominantly, who are in the top of the run, the corporations, the political offices, the, the criminal justice system, the foundations, the think tanks, the cultural institutions, and, and though that smaller group is really a power elite, they're the ones that make the decisions to the benefit of the ruling class. So would these be the people that are on the boards of large corporations, for instance? Some of them are on the boards. Um, more often, they're the, the actual directors, the CEOs of the major corporations. They're the um, tops of the political parties. They're the ones who are running the foundations and think tanks and... Uh, major cultural institution, major media companies, things like that. 
Um, so, you know, and below them, there's a whole class of people who are really the managerial class, the next, what I would call maybe about the 19, next 19 percent of the population. Uh, they don't have nearly the wealth or the, the power, um, but they carry out the, the, the management of those institutions. They're the, just below the top rungs, they're the ones that are actually the day-to-day -day operations, really. So those two, you know, if you look at the ruling class and the managerial class together, they own uh, most of the financial wealth of the country. And so together they really are the owning classes. And that's 20% of the population. The rest of the, the, the other 80% of us um, are really dividing up only about 9% of the financial wealth of this country. That's how extreme the inequality is, is becoming in the United States. Talk about the tools that these people, the power elite, use to keep themselves in power? Well, I think the, the three basic tools they use, um, one is the Constitution itself, which was set up to protect private property, to protect wealth, to keep to set up an electoral system that, again, made it much easier to influence political decisions. Um, um, so the, the second tool, the major tool, is the, corpor the corporation itself which was really became a major factor in the uh, late 1870s, 80s, 90s, be, um, and really is the, what, what we see in our communities. That's the visible decision-making body that comes in and drives out small businesses, moves manufacturing overseas, puts toxic waste in our communities, as the previous program was, was talking about. Um, so the uh, corporation as a tool, it, it limits the liability, it limits the visibility of the actual decision makers. It concentrates tremendous wealth and power in a, in a very small number of hands. Um, and then when there is conflict or when they're in, you know, the ruling class is not unanimous. Uh, it's a large group. There's lots of differences of opinion and strategies. When things come up between them, then um, the court system um, is set up to uh, enhance and, and protect their interests, but also to settle disputes between them. Um, and so the courts, uh, well, we saw that in the 2000 election where um, the courts stepped in and uh, it was basically a decision between two ruling class white Christian men about who was going to be president. Um, and I'm not, I'm not saying that there's no difference between the, the Democrats and Republicans, but they are both ruling class parties and they both share much more common interests than they than they then they don't, and the court stepped in and decided which one of them was going to be uh, president. Some people would say this view of a ruling class is very uh, conspiratorial. You know? Well, it, it's not in, in, in a couple of, of senses. First of all, uh, eight, nine, ten thousand people don't sit in a dark room in the back of the office, you know, making plan over smoky tables, um, making cons you know plans to take over. First of all, they they are public. Um, Everything, not everything they do is legal, but they are working through legitimate channels, legal channels, uh, public um, channels. Um, they're, they, m many of them know of others. Um, they're in common networks. Um, they travel in certain places. They vacation in certain places. They go to certain conferences. They, they read the same media. Um, and so there's a common culture, but a lot of them don't know each other. Um, a lot of them are not real visible. Um, so it's, it's no, by no means a conspiracy, but it is an elite. It is a powerful network of, and, and when I say predominantly white males um, and predominantly Christian, there's a few women, there's a few people of color, there's a few Jews and, and other non-Christians, but primarily the culture and the, the dominant backgrounds and genders of, uh, are white male Christian in, that, in those networks. We can see some of them in the government, um, you know, people like Dick Cheney and Karl Rove and people like that who are the, the power holders in the, in the government. Um, and we can look in various other places in the society and, you know, some of them are very visible, some of them are very, you know, keep very low profiles. And they do that by choice? I, I assume so, right. Talk a bit about more, again, of the... Uh the infrastructure and the different tools that um, the power elite would use to keep themselves in place. How about the media? What is their role in all this? 
Well, uh, the power elite are, are the ones at the top of the media corporations, really. Um, and as many of the media corporations are actually larger multinational corporations that have media arms at this point. Companies like GE, for instance, things like that. Um, but um, the media has been consolidated. It's monopolized by a very so six or seven major multinational corporations. Um, the power elite is very much at the top of making decisions and making sure that what people hear is consistent with the messages that they want people to hear, one of which is that there really isn't a ruling class. <laughs> that, that really is, you know, there's equal opportunity, and if you don't succeed, it's your own problem. Um, and then, of course, the corporations themselves are money generating, so the money comes goes to the ruling class um, out of our pockets. Um, so it's, but it's not just the media. Um, the ruling class has a, a whole vast network of, of think tanks to develop policy, of foundations to fund the think tanks. Foundations themselves are just a tool to avoid paying taxes to the government, to keep control of that money, um, and then to sponsor and pay for the projects that benefit that class. Um, so there's there's you know there there there's a lot of institutions that are part of the network of how power is maintained. The lobbying industry is another arm of how um, the ruling class and the power elite influence public policy decisions. So the media fits in, you know, is, is interwoven with many of those aspects. And then the, <clears throat> the other thing is that there's many ways that they actually keep their money and protect their money. Um, and so some of that is through... Um, uh, laws around corporations, rules and regulations. Some of it's around public policy, around taxes, um, investing, um, um, tax dodges, tax havens, um, uh, tax policies that lower corporate tax rates or lower individual tax rates. Or um, We've seen in the last 40 or 50 years tremendous shift of, of tax burden onto working and middle class people and away from the ruling class as tax rates have come down, um, estate taxes, corporate taxes, personal income taxes, capital gains taxes. In fact, just this week, we've seen another round of shifting money more and more concentratedly into the hands of the ruling class. Well, so it kind of begs the question then, what can you know, regular people do to combat this? Well, I, I think there's a lot of things that, that people are doing. Um, people are organizing constantly and a long history of, of organizing um, for economic justice and for racial and gender justice. And, and, and um, we wouldn't have an eight-hour working day. We wouldn't have a 40-hour working week and a weekend. Um, we wouldn't have unions if people hadn't organized a great cost over decades to win some of those gains. Uh, we wouldn't have civil rights. Um, so it, people are constantly organizing. I think the, 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 one of the main keys, though, is this: it's not about what we do individually. It's how we hook up with other people um, in larger communities, in larger organizations, because the ruling class is very organized. They may be split on many issues, particularly social policy issues like abortion rights or um, mar gay marriage or things like that. But when it comes to their economic interest, they're a powerful example of how people come together um, strategically across many kinds of differences to protect their interests. And I think that's one of the reasons why it's so important that we understand the economic framework is because we often get divided um, among ourselves because of differences in, in political interests and strategies, and, and, and we get divided by race and gender and sexual orientation. And so unless we have a larger picture of the long-term struggle, we continually are less effective in terms of really pushing for large-scale redistribution of wealth. Well, in, in getting back to the media, a lot of people aren't uh, really aware of when one talks about media, you immediately think of, let's say, radio and television and newspapers. But, for instance, things like book companies that produce the very textbooks <coughs> that are then integrated in schools is uh, one aspect of conveying ideas to a culture. Right. And I think that that's part of what uh, obviously we're not meant to to see is that these the largest media corporations are they're not just a TV or movie company or a book publishing company or a cable company um, or a magazine company, but most of them control many different aspects of media, and so the consolidation is 
is much more dramatic and severe than most of us can see in our day-to-day -day lives because the names, it's like going into a grocery store and you see, you know, 10,000 products on the shelves and you see 50 varieties of cereal. Well, there's two or three cereal companies that have given you the illusion that you can buy any of their many different products and they're they're really different products and they're really different companies. But in fact, behind that is a tremendous concentration of wealth and power. And the media is the same way. On the cover of your book, you call this a democracy. You have a really intriguing illustration of, uh, of the power elite and different organizations, well, different structures that it interacts with. Another one of those, in addition to, you'd mentioned foundations and corporations, but one of them you have here is elite universities. Would you talk about that? I think that that's uh, one important piece of the whole project. Um, as the um, ruling class, you know, and many of the ruling class kind of step back from direct um, control of major corporations, as the corporation world became much more complex and sophisticated, you, the the ruling class needed a, a highly trained managerial elite, basically, to run things um, and to keep money and power, you know, in place. And so the ed, university system, it, I mean, it, it's clear to everybody that's highly stratified, you know, that um, uh, Harvard and Yale and the top elite universities are tremendously powerful and rich institutions. If you live in the areas that they are, then you're aware of how much power they control in terms of um, politics. Um, they have endowments of billions of dollars. Um, we're talking about 10, 20, 30 billion dollars in, in the endowment. So they also control tremendous uh, money. But their primary purpose is to train managerial and ruling class youth into becoming the next generation of ruling class and, and, and power elite um, people. So um, there's a tremendous screening that goes on into who can get into those institutions and then who succeeds and actually gets certified to be safe and uh, skilled and professional enough to be able to hold, you know, bits and pieces of the power at the top. Um, you can see the, 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 the channeling into that from managerial and ruling class families uh, starts with um, private schools, independent schools, and also elite uh, suburban schools. And those two, those are the two kind of um, feeding lines into the elite liberal arts universities and the 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 the, the most elite uh, state institutions and on into the graduate schools and the graduate school programs are really where a lot of the people get sorted out whether they really have the 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 capability of making fairly autonomous decisions but within a very rigid set of parameters of thought, a, a very, you know, acceptance of the common assumptions of a capitalist, imperialist kind of society. And yet, if you uh, listen to people like uh, Lynn Cheney, the wife of uh, Dick Cheney, uh, vice president, she headed up some committee that said that the universities are breeding grounds for uh, liberal uh, thoughts that are uh, corrupting the youth of today. Right. Well, and it's highly ironic. Um, but I think that there is always a tension. I mean, when you do educate people, inevitably, some of them actually begin to think independently and critically and, you know, begin to challenge some of the assumptions. And so part of the, particularly the graduate school process is to really screen out who is ideologically safe and who is going to be a troublemaker, who is going to ask those questions. Um, and in fact, I think the universities. uh unfortunately do a pretty good job of that screening so that uh, at that level there's 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 some tolerance for dissent um, but when those people get into the law firms the management firms the financial systems the the banks the um, they've they've mostly been screened pretty carefully about who's actually going to be safe who's actually going to carry out the the reinforce the system make sure that things operate smoothly and then speaking again with the universities as an example here, you can see a trend, at least in my lifetime, where public universities, are their funding is getting cut. They're becoming much more dependent on private donations, much more dependent on corporate contributions. Do you see that as further feeding this uh, system? Absolutely. Um, they're, they're, 
the university, most of the large universities are corporatized. I mean, they are corporations. They're huge financial entities in their own right. Um, and they are therefore training people to adapt and live in um, that kind of environment. Um, and of course, we know that as funding is cut back for public education, um, it limits more and more who gets into. Uh, only 25% of the, the adult U.S. population has a four-year college degree. Um, I think generally we think that uh, a college degree is open to everybody, and it's widely available and widely uh, used, but um, tremendous numbers of our young people don't make it to graduate high school, um, and then even more start college and don't finish. So when we're, you know, the, the screening is really severe at every level, and people get very clear messages early on about where their place is, where they're expected to end up. Um, and that's by race and class in particular. Um, so, yeah, the, the whole education system is very much a part of how the system is maintained. Why uh, a lot of people might be listening to this and saying, well, we, that's a nice theory, but we live in a representative democracy and, you know, I regularly vote and, you know, they would discount this whole power elite thing just on that alone. The Constitution is there for all of us. How can you say it's, you know, really benefits this power elite? Well, I think that, that you know, that's, that's the, the, the myth. That's the ideology that we have, that, that it is democracy. But I think that if you look at the decisions that get made, not the political process, but the decisions, who decides what we eat? Who decides what our neighborhoods look like? Who decides where we work and how much we're paid and what the conditions are? Those are not, uh, those are decisions that are made by the corporations in our communities. Um, and if you look at who makes those decisions, we don't vote on that, right? When was the last time you had a vote about, you know, whether there's genetically modified food in your, in your soybeans or corn? Um, when was the last time you got to vote about whether the uh, jobs in Seattle moved to Taiwan or, you know, uh, Mexico? Um, so we have to look at d democracy. If it means anything, means making decisions about issues that impact your life. And in almost any respect we can look to in this country, those are not decisions that you and I are getting to make. Um, we actually don't even get to determine who our political representatives, as symbolic as that is, even there, when you look at what it costs to be a candidate in major elections and where that money comes from, um, even a, a contribution of $1,000 to a candidate is a huge contribution. And um, only about 2% of the population makes a contribution of $1,000 or more to a political candidate. And these days, $1,000 is nothing. I mean, if you don't put in 10000 or 20000 or 100000 you're not a player. You don't have input into that political decision. So, the, and, 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 and on top of that, the candidates themselves are mostly very rich, especially uh, senators, representatives. It's not only that they have to raise all this corporate money and therefore beholden and make decisions back to those corporate sponsors, but they themselves end up putting a tremendous amount of their own money in because you have to have that kind of uh, money to run. So um, there, there's very little substance behind the myth of democracy in this country. Um, it's really like the Wizard of Oz standing behind the screen. You can just pull the screen back a very tiny little corner and you can see that there's nothing behind it. Um, and I think, you know, more people were aware of that in the last couple of elections where there was even more direct, visible manipulation um, and disenfranchisement of a large number of voters. But I think it's been true all along, and, and we need to not just fix the small pieces of the system. We need to fix the larger system, pieces of that system. Uh, and, uh, again, I think that the, the subtitle of my book um, is Who Benefits, Who Pays, and re Who Really Decides? And I think that that's a key. Those are the questions we have to constantly be asking because we're fed all kinds of misinformation from our textbooks to the daily news to the, the, the weekly news magazines. The, the only way to get underneath that is to be asking who really is benefiting from these decisions. However they're framed, who's going to end up with cash in their pocket? Who's going to pay? Whose pockets is the money going to come out of? And who's really making the decisions? And if we're honest about the who's making the decisions, it's not a democratic process. 
The other thing I think is really important is the democracy is much more than voting once a year or once every four years. That democracy is about participating, like I said, in the decisions that impact our lives. That means in our families. That means in our classrooms. That means in our workplaces. That means in our communities. And so we need to be building a culture, all of us, of democracy in our daily lives um, because it's a, it's a complete illusion that if we vote once every four years for a couple of rich white Christian men to whether which one is going to be president, where even if we had a meaningful vote in that process and we had no democracy in the rest of our lives, we wouldn't be building the kind of communities that most of us want to live in. So there's a lot that we need to think about each of us in terms of how are we practicing democracy? How are we challenging hierarchy around us? How are we building processes um, in our you know, local situations that um, gives us the practice of democracy you know, so that we begin to get better at working together? At, you know, if you think about the social movements in our history, they came out of um, people sitting around in, in groups, in support groups, in critical thinking study groups, in um, many kinds of cooperatives and collectives and all kinds of democratic processes that were involved and in people coming together and thinking about how to build uh, movements for social change. And so uh, one of our challenges today is to reclaim that democratic impulse and put it into our organizing in the community. All right, we're talking with Paul Kivel, and you are going to be doing a uh, workshop here in town on Monday. It's got limited seating, so people can reserve a spot for that through local organization Tools for Change. And their number is 329-2201. That's area code 206, 329-2201. Or you can reach them online at info at toolsforchange.org. Uh, Tools for Change is a tremendous local resource that helps people come together and look at these kinds of issues and develop common vision and strategies for really making a difference in their communities. Um, I also want to just mention that there's a lot of resources on my website, um, articles, exercises. We have a lot of uh, other books and curricula. Um, and that is just simply uh, www.paulkivel, P-A-U-L-K-I-V-E-L.com. So I encourage people to get in touch with me, um, get in touch with folks at Tools for Change, and to really think about these basic questions, who benefits, who pays, and who really decides. As well as you've got a lot of resources uh, listed in the back of your book. It's Correct. Kind of like, it's kind of like a workbook, actually. Um, so I want to thank you for coming in this morning. Sure, it's been my pleasure. We've just been talking with Paul Kibble. He is author of the new book, You Call This a Democracy, Who Benefits, Who Pays, and who really decides.